All right. Hello again, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to my seminar uh, workshop about psychic learn. My name is Chi Yang Hu. I work at the UCLA Office of the Advanced Research Computing. This is my second talk about learning psychic learn. So in this talk, I will focus on uh, some advanced topics. Specifically, I will talk about how to use uh, scikit learn to do some high performance machine learning. I know this is, might be a very um, advanced topic or uh, not a uh, not easy talk for for uh, for a two hour workshop, but I will try my best. I'm gonna give you some basic ideas about how um, what when we're talking about performance doing the machine learning task, uh, what does that mean? And also there are some general performance tips and tricks in using scikit-learn. And also if we want to really want to boost the performance, how can we do that? It's a, uh, I will focus on two, uh, two aspects. One is making the computation faster. And one is how can we efficiently process the large data sets. I want to mention that it's a, this is about using scikit-learn, but the, the scikit-learn are actually um, may not be a good choice for us to doing some real large scale machine learning. So in the talk, I will actually expand a little bit or I will introduce some other like options or libraries to extend uh, the scikit-learn capability. So basically sometimes we will use scikit-learn-ish tools. Uh, those kind of like tools uh, may have the same, may have the, uh, so Marcos, you're saying uh, you cannot hear? Um, the, oh, okay. So uh, my point is like uh, the scikit learn tools will be included a lot of libraries that internally it may not be the original scikit learn, but it actually provide with a very similar or the same uh, APIs or interface. So you will see it looks pretty much like the scikit learn. Okay, so let's uh, focus on the, uh, to see what is the performance issues that we are talking about when we are doing the machine learning task. So there are multiple, when we're talking about the machine learning performance, there are actually not as simply as the traditional um, traditional algorithm or modeling work. So basically we know that we have the training part and the testing part. And uh, the first measure for the machine learning performance is in the training. So here is the most uh, um, the commonly we will recognize uh, the machine learning performance is related with how many number of training instance or data go through the training process in the unit time. So this is a very important measure. Um, it's actually directly impact the time taking during the training period. Well, we act, usually we 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 usually take uh, the the training and in an offline mode. I mean, offline meaning like it's not a real time emergency to train or to get the model trained. So, in most cases, especially in the production cases, this are actually although we very the first come up in our mind is the training throughput, but in reality, it may be less important. Um, compared to the other two measures for machine learning performance. So, um, so in addition to the training, then the prediction would be also a very good measure for the machine learning performance. In another words, people may concern more about the, another, the second measure that is a prediction latency. They use latency, meaning whenever you see latency is meaning the time to take uh, whatever uh, operation or something. So in prediction latency, it means the time taken by a deployed model 
or train model to make prediction. Usually we use like a say microseconds. It is a very, very important metric in real time or sometimes people call it like online prediction scenarios, uh, often viewed as a, so they are not a sing, single number. They are often viewed as a distribution and measured as the latency at a, some or certain person time. And uh, so other than the time taken by the prediction, so remember that the second one is the time to take a single prediction. Sometimes we need how we make the prediction uh, in a bunk. So basically we want, we concern about, we want to know about uh, the, they call it the prediction throughput. So it means the number of predictions made in the unit time. So this is a, also very important metric because in most cases in a, like a production or practical scenario, we want to do not in a single like prediction one by one, but we want to do with the, some batch or somebody called that like a, the bonk prediction. So that's also matters a lot. And uh, there are, so based on those uh, training and uh, prediction, those three triangles. So there are a couple of uh, factors. So then we can think about what kind of factors can really affect machine learning performance, of course. So we're talking about the machine learning uh, tasks. We always have training and the, ta and the test and for the machine learning work so we I, I think that's my way so it's i always look at the problem through the two different angles one is from the data another one is from model so the model the the data of course so we everybody will actually have the sense that the number of the data or the size of the data scales of the data matters a lot so the number of instances of the data, including the training, the numbers that the data for the training stage and the data for the prediction stage. And uh, at the same time, when we're talking about like high performance machine learning, we have to consider about another uh, aspect for the data. It is uh, the, it is uh, actually, we have to uh, wondering whether the, data are available upfront. So upfront, upfront, meaning like whether it's data is available or it has to be loaded in the one time, everything in memory, something like that. So that's the upfront availability would be also another factor that we have to keep up in our mind. So, and the, when it's uh, in the data, those triangle. So the another thing that we want to talk about is uh, how, what kind of, or, or how many or what related feature in the data set that might, we should, uh, uh, we should consider that, or we should include it in a model. Um, for example, like, a, is that a, mm, how many features that we need to count? And uh, within all like, um, huge amount of uh, features and what would be the importance or what the most important uh, features that would um, that we should mine or we should consider and uh, of, and of course like uh, so there is a how can we select uh, an efficient representation for the features I mean for here there's a uh, there's a very deep topic on 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 this uh, feature representation, and of course, and the number of features, importance of features. So that's why those two triangles are actually mingled or tangled together. So it's actually related with the model. But I want to mention that from the data or from the how to say that is a uh, input or storage or input that type of a uh, uh, viewpoint. The feature representation for here, I only want to mention about uh, for the science and uh, engineering like uh, problems. So we 
for me, I'm I I'm referring to like the dense or sparse representation specifically. Of course, they have others. Say, for example, in the natural language processing, they may have a lot of a topic related with those feature representation. How can we how can we find a good way? So that sometimes is the key. But in the science engine and the engineering problems, so it's maybe very important to consider whether it's dense or the sparse representations. So the the dense and the the dense and the sparse representations, meaning we have to consider about sometimes called sparsity ratio, meaning like a proportion of the zeros in data. And um, so um, there are some general rule that if if you better to check that how many number of the zeros or the proportion of zeros in the data. A number rule that I can say here is if the sparsity ratio less than 10%, then better to use, I mean, as like a 10% of the data, not zero, then it's better for us to use the dense representations because it have a lot of advantages, like saying like we can have optimized vector operations we can have a, we can do the multi-threading in libraries, better support for the multi-threading in libraries, and the fewer CPU cache misses. But if your sparsity ratio bigger than ninety percent, I mean, though those are ninety percent data are zeros, and then it's better to use the SciPy uh, sparse matrix representations. Um, so basically, that's a, that means that we don't store the zero values, and then um, we can get the benefit from like uh, the memory usage. So basically, it's a huge reduction for the memory usage. And also, whenever doing matrix multiplications, we will have to do some dot products, so they will over uh, far fewer elements doing that. And uh, we can see... I think we already shown some examples in our last week in our uh, comparing with the SciPy, TensorFlow, and PyTorch. We can speed up the prediction considerably. So uh, at least one orders or one to two orders of a magnitude uh, faster. So that's a uh, data, the number of data and the format or the representation, the form of the data that we feed or into the model. Um, in the model, of course, so we know that the algorithms, so what kind of algorithms, what kind of model you use, or the complexity in the, in, in the algorithms matters a lot to affect uh, machine learning's performance. And uh, there are many algorithms, so they their latency depends on hyperparameters. For example, in the stochastic gradient descent, latency uh, increases with number of non-zero coefficients. Um, for example, in the uh, in scikit-learn support vector machines, latency increases with number of support vectors. Of course, like say, random forest, like tree-based ensembles, uh, their latency increases with the number of trees that you actually input or in your hyperparameter. So you may have to consider that. And uh, there's, uh, in, I mean, for here is like you will have to make the test for your own problems to find an optimi uh, uh, optimum, uh, optimize the value for those hyperparameters because some hyperparameters actually have dramatic change for the performance. So, and also there's a bunch of optimized libraries that during the model that you have to uh, consider. Say, for example, like in scikit-learn, if it relies heavily on the NumPy and the SciPy, and we better to ensure the NumPy and whenever we install the NumPy, we have to make sure that the NumPy is built using optimized BLAST or LaPack, those kind of like optimized uh, libraries um, in the lower level. Uh, so, but uh, the optimized library, I want to mention that uh, pra uh, practically 
my experience is that like, it can speed up the linear model uh, considerably, but for the nonlinear model, it may not that uh, uh, that effective. You it's, it's, you need some special uh, techniques doing that. And for example, in the nonlinear model, I want to say that in the decision tree based, let's say the random forest, uh, those kind of uh, models and machine learning models is relatively unaffected by those optimized libraries. So because they may use less like a matrix related uh, operations. And of course, so um, as your model and the data grown bigger and bigger. So we first we're thinking about it is to take advantage of multi-core uh, environment. So basically we want to apply with some multi-threading, multi-processing, distributed and on and offload the computational or model operations uh, from CPU to some accelerators. So we will talk about that in our later slides in a, in a little bit of details. And of course, and of course, if if data is too big, too large to fit in a memory, and uh, so uh, so we need to training our so we cannot load that. Then we may need to have those technology named like out of core learning. Basically, the out of core learning, meaning we want the model can learn at least something with partial or without seeing all of the instance at once. So those are actually, I would say that those are some advantage for the scikit learn because in scikit learn, it provides a group of estimators, I mean, the models that can do with some partial fit. So those are very, uh, good uh, examples for an out of core learning. So in the later, we will we will use a couple of slides, and I will show you one of the demos to do a simple, uh, small problems, but using the out of core learning techniques. And of course, the model can uh, sometimes the data complexity uh, will affect the machine learning performance. So let's say, so that's uh, the, the, the tangled part come in. That, that means we may need the model to do the feature selection first. So basically we want to choose a subset of original uh, like variables and by something like a filter method, wrapper methods, embedded methods, and also the we want the model can extract the related or most important features. So to detect the most important features. So by, let's say, uh, for example, like one, we work with the images and text feature extractions. Um, in that case, in like multi-model uh, predictions. So those feature extractions are often the bottleneck of the scaling. So this would be a very, um, it's a very hard topic actually. So, and also we need to like uh, make the transformation, doing some transform, a uh, transformation on the selected features. And of course, so uh, for, especially for the production, because we, as we mentioned, that like a pre uh, pre prediction as the most, the more, uh, more related for our like machine learning performance in practice. And uh, we will talk about in the later slides about uh, during the prediction. And sometimes we have to keep in mind that uh, many libraries, uh, they actually have some validation overhead. So those validation overhead are actually automatically uh, invoked when when we're doing the prediction, let's say the dot predict method. So those are those are okay that if we, we're running some small scales of the data, but for in the larger scales, it will actually hurt a lot. Um, and also we may consider about, because we will want to uh, boost the performance of the prediction. Um, 
this is our uh, this is usually our this is usually uh, the the main task for the performance machine learning performance is we want to make the pr prediction faster as fast as possible so we may need to compress the model so basically there's uh, they provide a lot of libraries provided with some dot uh, sparsify uh, sparsify method to make uh, the model more compact and also we may need to uh, reshape re reshape the model reshape model meaning we may need to eliminate it some features that uh, that we not needed, or we after the training we know that some features may not be uh, needed, or may not be be uh, may may not that affect that kind of things. Then we have to reshape our established or trained model. So unfortunately, in this step, usually we need to perform a uh, poor perform that kind of a reshaping operations manually it's a i don't see there is any automatic uh, ways to to doing that so um so we already talked about the i hope you can get some general ideas about the performance issues we need to consider when we are doing some large scale or high performance required machine learning task uh, let me know if you have any questions. I know that there's a this talk. Uh, this talk we only have limited time, and that we don't have uh, too much uh, online resources to to illustrate the every ideas or the jargons on that. So um, my focus would be to give you some general idea, and I hope that you can get some uh, understanding, basic understanding. And then if you're really interested on some topics, uh, you, you can let me know. And I would be very happy to, to discuss with you and uh, provide my, my uh, knowledge. And then, and then we can learn from each other. So the next topic I want to talk about is the general performance tips and tricks in the scikit-learn. So this is a basic I want to dedicated as this, this section to the original like a secular library. And uh, before we are talking about uh, the performance, I usually want to mention about uh, uh, there's a criteria that we, whenever we're doing performance work. So in the data nude in, in his uh, like a, the Bible type of the book. So he actually just mentioned that the real problem is that programmers have spent far too much time worrying about efficiency in the wrong places at the wrong times. So the point here is you don't have to consider about performance issues. Um, the, the most important thing for us I mean, us meaning like uh, code developers would be to have some code ready and working. So make it simpler, easier to read, easier to maintain and everything running okay. So basically uh, to get something done. So don't worry about the performance um, too early. So um, sometimes if you really need to boost the performance, then you can start to thinking about how to make it faster or better or more efficient. So here, uh, the if, so that's uh, actually prerequisite to come into the domain of how to boost the psychic learn like uh, projects or work. Um, just make sure everything working all right. When you get everything all right, working fine, and for some like a basic that kind of uh, uh, goals already uh, achieved, then we can thinking about there is a couple of uh, tips that uh, specifically for the secular project. Uh, one is actually secular is a Python library. So we have to follow, there is a, we have, we have to start it with some uh, general performance tips for a general Python project. 
the first step would be to profile your Python code. So basically that's a profiling meaning we need to ident identify the major bottlenecks for our for our work. Um, it's a it's a pretty simple task for us to start it with uh, enable the profiling. So for example, and that you can enter like the simple pip install command, like a pip install line profiler or pip install memory profiler so that you can get some ideas on what your code looks like. And uh, I think I used, uh, I illustrated with the memory profiler in our previous like uh, demos, one of my pre, uh, our previous demos in the last week. So when you know that where is your major bottleneck, you need to, uh, you need to worry about. And then the second step would be to consider about the NumPy and SciPy. It's not considered started, it's not a good idea to start it thinking about in the scikit-learn because scikit-learn just as in some case, uh, um, in both cases, it's just the wrapper to, they have to internally calling to the NumPy and the SciPy. So uh, from my experience, most of the performance like a bottleneck can be, uh, can be like a can be speed up and can can be resolved by the numpy and the scipy tricks. For example, like a you can you need to you need to try to replace all the uh, all the explicit loops to like especially the nested loops by calls to equivalent numpy and the scipy method. So it can uh. It's a the simple, like say the vectorization uh, operations for the NumPy and SciPy can avoid the CPU wasting time in the Python interpreter using so, and by doing the vectorized uh, calculations, so you will see that your um, your code will have uh, at least uh, I would say one order of magnitude faster. So that's my my uh, previous experience. So of course I list a couple of uh, I list uh, um I put a link like say that's a uh, core performance tips for the NumPy and SciPy. It is a uh it's sort of old but it's still valid. So I would recommend you to check with that and to know more about NumPy and SciPy because there's a huge amount of tricks for the NumPy SciPy. So basically that's not an issue for the secular, but also for how to play around with the NumPy and the SciPy itself. And if the NumPy SciPy cannot solving the performance problems, then you probably you need to um, check or look into the Cython. So the Cython, I don't know how, um, how many of you attended my uh, sem uh, my workshop last quarter. I'm talking a lot about uh, how to um, writing the high performance Python. So under the secular context, so there's a so there's a, a bunch of uh, they actually they already incorporated with a lot of uh, uh, Cython internally in lib linear lib supported the vector machine and also for the in the many models so um if in some cases you may have to using the cython by yourself to write a bunch of like a, the code to to take advantage of open mp functions inside of the code so um so this is the basic performance tips for the scikit-learn. And I want to list a couple of uh, tweaks and tricks that you can try specifically when you're working on the scikit-learn. So if you have any, because I know that previous slides is mainly talking about uh, the Python, uh, Python performance issues. So if you have any questions or concerns or want to make more discussions, so let me know.
uh, during this talk, we will focus on the scikit-learn. And there are a couple of uh, uh, tweaks and tricks that I want to list here. So it's actually more than that. But uh, there's uh, something that uh, always we can, or maybe a very easier way to thinking about. One is uh, limiting working memory. Some calculations, one implemented using standard NumPy, even under the vectorized operations. So they actually involve using a large amount of a temporary memory. This may potentially use up, quickly use up a system memory. So especially when we are dealing with the, with the large data sets. And the one trick that we can try is, uh, it may not work, but you can try that we can explicitly limit the amount of a temporary working memory Say, for example, we limited that the working memory would be 128 megabytes. So in the second learn, we can um, we can you know, we can use the set set config and uh, uh, or config and this underscore context to doing those operations to limit the working memory. For example, if you're running some demos on Google Colab, so they may have a very limited amount of memory assigned to you. And then you want to try to run some uh, demos or something, but the data will may just use up the, the allocated memory, then you can try this trick. Sometimes I found like it's may not working very well, but it's, it's, it's a, I think there's a one way for us to try. Another thing is uh, we can configuring for reduced validation overhead. As we mentioned in our like a performance issue slide, scikit-learn always do some validation on data. That will actually increases the overhead per call to predict and the similar functions. For example, they may automatically check whether the data is, all the data is in the NumPy format or equivalent the pandas frame data frame. And uh, they want to make sure that the, the data shape is consistent um, everywhere, something like that. And also there uh, most likely, uh, in most cases, those checkings are okay. Those automatic validation checkings are okay. But in some cases, when especially when we're doing with the prediction work, so, we will get heard. For example, like there is a op automatic operation done by the scikit-learn is they will check that the features are finite, not none, uh, not a, 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 like now or infinite. So those checkings are actually involves or requires a full pass over of all the data. So those are actually can can be a, a deadly bottleneck for especially for the prediction stage. And uh, the simple trick is we can suppress checking for finite list by setting the environment variables before import the scikit learn. Or let's say this one are actually the the in the uh, set the environment of variables under the operation operational uh uh. uh and under the OS level of that, or we can configure it in the Python using like a set config or using a con uh, config context in the scikit-learn to say that we want to disable, we want to assume, we want to, let's say, okay, so don't check that. We assume like the finite is true. So those are actually um, save us a lot of time for, for those, uh, uh, validation, like uh, overhead times. And of course, sometimes we, as we mentioned, sometimes the we need we may need to compress the model during our pre, uh, during our prediction uh, stage of work. Um, unfortunately, I would say that uh, the, uh, not unfortunately, but the scikit-learn right now only uh, concerns about the linear models. So um, I 
I'm, I'm not sure whether those are actually under development for nonlinear models, but in, or maybe this is uh, the main reason is like the compression model, compression operation would be most effective for the linear models. But right now it's only for the linear models for the moment. In a, a context, it means that we want to control the model like a sparsity I mean, the sparsity meaning like the number of non-zero coordinates in the model vectors. So it's a general, a good idea to combine the model sparsity with the sparse input data representation. Let's, uh, let's say that with the SciPy is a sparse data format. So here's the example code that illustrates the use of a sparsify method. And in this example, we prefer to use elastic net penalty. That means the combined with the two um, L0, 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 L1, and L2, that kind of a regularization penalty. It is often a good compromise between the model compactness and the prediction power. And of course, we can set the combination with the regularization strength alpha to control the trade-off so it's a, I would say that this is, might be a hard to say what values would work for every case, but you have to try by yourself. And uh, so, uh, and then we call dot sparsify to compress the model. Um, a typical benchmark on synthetic data. So I saw there's some, somebody doing running on the synthetic data and the doing those kind of model compression, so they can get the 30% of increase in latency, in prediction latency, when both model and the input are sparse. So of course, not to say that a sparse, uh, sparsified model, uh, it can be very useful to reduce the memory usage uh, of the predicted model. So that is uh, on the production servers, you want to deploy your, to make the predictions on the production servers. And then you can save a lot, a lot of memory and doing uh, more things maybe together and uh, maybe quicker. So that's a very big advantage. And uh, uh, fourth trick is uh, the reshaping uh, the model. So reshaping meaning to uh, just to select only a portion of available features to fit the model. Um, in another words, if a model uh, does not use our uh, features during the learning phase, we can just uh, strip those off from the input beforehand. Uh, so we can get a lot of benefit on doing those reshaping, meaning, for example, like we, it, of all, obviously to reduce the memory and therefore the time overhead of the model itself. And also it can help with the IOs usage and processing time for during the data processing like data access or feature extractions. Uh, so basically we don't have to collect and build the features uh, that will be discarded anyway in the model stage. It, uh, uh, I think as also sometimes as uh, during the pipeline of that, it's a uh, one we are we are discard or we get rid of the 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 features or we just uh, use the slim more slim the model. It will we will um, we will actually got a, a much much better performance obviously. Uh, but of course, uh, as I mentioned, it need to be performed manually on that. So the last trick would be to, we should consider to make the prediction in the bunk mode. So uh, so generally speaking, doing the bunk mode always uh, faster because at um, in bunk mode, meaning we input our, we want to do running the prediction for uh, like doing the pre pre uh, prediction work for uh, many data instances at the same time. So those are compared with the general way that we are doing in, a, in the testing stage, that meaning like a, some, uh, some people calling it as an atomic mode, meaning we feed the instance one by one 
once a time. Um, I would say that if there there's a uh, I I read from the documentation site for the scikit-learn, so they uh, they are running a benchmark for the prediction time per instance on the setting with a few features that uh, independently of uh, estimator choice. So they compare the running in the two modes. So I mean two modes meaning in the compare with the bunk mode versus the atomic mode. There is the result, there is a result shows the bunk mode is, um, I think it's a sum of the results showing they have a one to two orders of a magnitude. So it's a, sometimes it's a, it's a not straightforward way to understand that. Um, but uh, I'm thinking, uh, but from my understanding, doing the bunk mode will give us a couple of uh, benefits. For example, like uh, some machine learning tasks using to, uh, to involves to predict the multiple branches. So say, the, the decision tree, random forest, that kind of thing. So they, the bunk mode actually can expand their branching predictability. And uh, when we doing the prediction in bunk, it means that we do a big amount of a similar or exact the same matrix uh, operations for the data set. In this scenario, so we actually, um, using we can use the cpu caching that operation is a big advantage to apply the sometimes the same weight and for the similar matrix uh, operation or the same matrix uh, operations in the model so that's it will save us a lot of time and of course some linear algebra libraries optimized in those bunk mode uh, so, and then those are previous slides that shows uh, the, some general performance tips and the tricks in the scikit-learn itself. So I would say that sometimes in the reality, it may not uh, that uh, working well or different. What we feel is different from the benchmarks that, that they show. So that's actually this that's actually because the problem for the machine learning are actually um, sometimes is very complicated. It's case by case. So you may, I'm just showing just only the basic principles that you may keep in mind and you may try, but sometimes it's may not working that well. So just uh, we, I always, for myself, I always keep my expectation low for those performance tips. So, and uh but sometimes it's a really, but sometimes it's a, your, if your problem are actually just a one bottleneck that can, can be rightly fit for those tips, then that's, that will work pretty well. So um, in the production stage, so we, I will focus on the two major uh, problems uh, for the high performance machine learning. One is we want to make the computation faster. And uh, so when I were talking about make the computation faster, so there's a, an idea that frequently come to everybody's mind is we need to use or utilize to, to take advantage of multi-core uh, systems. Um, the multi-core or multi-core parallelism would the uh, would the uh, would have a lot of uh, like uh, choices of uh, using? We want to take advantage of the power of the multi CPU systems, or we uh, or we want to take advantage of the accelerators such as GPU, and also you want to say if we have our uh, high performance cluster system like Hop and Tool, so we want to take advantage of a distributed machines. So, and uh, this slides, I'm um, just a list uh, up to my knowledge for a couple of options or a variety of uh, libraries. They provided with us either based on the scikit-learn or they provided with 
exactly the same APIs for the scikit-learn, but they we will get the ability to process and to uh, to make the modeling using the multi-core um, parallelism or distributed parallelism. Uh, and of course, we get the benefit for the optimizations on that sense. So that include uh, Joblib and Rapids from NVIDIA and the one API from Intel and the Dask framework and the VAEX framework. And also there's some the new one that's uh, pretty hot that in the science uh, community, they call it the JAX. And I'm list the, the circle here, that means the Spark. Um, Spark's uh, machine learning library is suitable when you're doing relatively simple machine learning on the large data sets. But I in but intentionally leave those circle outside of the main circle because I noted that there's a bunch of a Spark, there's a many, there's at least two candidates I, I realized that work with a Spark, uh, work with a Spark and the Secular work together, but those are, but the, those projects are seamlessly deprecated. Um, I don't know what's going on with the, that field. So that's why in our talk, we will probably mention all those circles, but uh, we will leave the spark that uh, we will see how it goes. I don't know how, my, how many of you uh, interested or working with the spark, and I would really much like to know something from you if you have some knowledge about uh, using the uh, Apache Spark backend, uh, maybe running on some Spark clusters, but you want to try to running some scikit-learn related or scikit-learn-ish uh, tasks or di uh, running those distributed uh, machine learning tasks uh, running on the Spark cluster. So, so I'm really curious. So if you have anything that can share, please let me know. Okay, so the centerpiece that um, we have to mention is job lib. Job lib. Uh, job lib uh, we I believe that we uh, I mentioned the, the job lib in the as in the model persistency in my previous talk. Um, so in that sense, the job lib just using the pickle or maybe advanced pickle method to wrap up the to saving and the restoring the model. In general, Joblib is are actually a very powerful tool. So it's very light, lightweight, but it's doing a lot of things more than that. It's basically the provide a pipelining tools for us to, um, for example, like they provide some simpler, simple helper class to write the parallel for loops using multi-processing. And uh, I check with uh, some uh, underhood uh, like a document documentations for the joblet. So the joblet they doing a lot of jobs to speed up uh, the long running jobs. So for example, they can they they actually doing some specific optimizations for the NumPy arrays. They by defining the job in the in some uh, frame and uh, then not to evaluate until the runnings that provide uh, some extra additional capability for the scikit-learn to doing with some caching and the lazy evaluation to avoid computing repeatedly. And uh, there is a good thing that for the job leg is you don't have to change the code or control flow for your basic scikit-learn. You have your own code, and if you apply with the job leg and to define those uh, loops, and then you it, it, it will actually do the pipelining to the multi-core uh, multi or multi-processing environmental automatically. And uh, I would say that, that there's a couple of uh, uh, backends used because Joblet is just the pipeline tools and the wrapper they build up on top of the other uh, parallel. They have to running on the top of uh, other parallel backends. So from the doc documentations, you may find like uh, it can support the backends as low key 
multi-processing, threading, dusk, ray, such and such. So they are very versatile. And uh, if you have any experience on those, any those of the backends, it will quickly just adopt it, those work under the Joblet. Uh, job so they, um, I would say that uh, there's a bit, the relationship between the Joblet and the Scikit-learn are very tight. So it's uh, already used in many Scikit-learn classes, let's say ElasticNet, SGD classifiers of that. And uh, you can simply, under those uh, secular classes, you can simply tweak uh, the n underscore jobs with, uh, let's say, specify that number of jobs, and then you can run in the secular in a multi-thread uh, context. So, and uh, just that you know that it's uh, whenever you say number of jobs equals to minus, minus one, it means you want to use all available cores on that. And uh, the typical tasks uh, can be done parallel by the job lib would be to, if you want to do with some cross validation so that you divided the different parts of, uh, of the data to and uh, uh, for uh, like a, an iterator defining with the training and testing data to doing with the, some, they call it a cross validation. And also you want to do it with a grid search for a hyper, a hyper parameter space. And also sometimes you want to do with some multi-label predictions. And of course, with some ensemble learning. So that would be a very typical task that can be uh, handled by the droplet. And there is a, I would say that the job lab uh, by default, those integration with the secular are only for the multi or, or single machine environment. So if we want to, sometimes the question would be, how can we use the secular across different physical machines? So that's usually called as distributed secular. So then in that case, we may need to specify the job lib to use the dusk as the backend. Basically, the dusk are um, basic dusk are actually create a cluster within the Python, and then you running with the job lib dot parallel backend dusk, and then you can post your uh copy and paste your secular code under this uh, parallel backend the job lib. And then they were doing with sort of a distributed secular. So I would say that you may experience some overhead when doing with those distributed. You may, I mean, in other words, you may not get to that kind of a performance boost as we thinking about more cores and, and more uh, performance boost. I would say that whenever we're talking about the Joblet and talking about the different backends on the multi multi threading, multi core, multi processing, uh, reason that there's a hot topic uh, in the Python community that there's an officially announcement that there is a plan to develop in the Python that they they will uh, their aim is to remove the guild, like a, the global in, interpreter lock in Python permanently. I think this is a really uh, big news for all the Python users because it will enable much, much more efficient multi-threading because before that or until now, so Python, they have the guild enabled so that it's even under the job lib. So they have to do a lot of work to to make the multi-threading happening, real multi-threading happening in the in the interpreter. If that really happens, um, I believe so. Um, it will change our like a community, like an ecosystem a lot. So I don't know what will come up with the job level community or the secular, but I'm pretty sure that it will things will get uh, will get much much better in the sense of multi threading or multi processing environment. 
Okay, so um, I have a couple of uh, demos that to show um, for how to use the la uh, the the libraries that I introduced, um, and I want to. So let's. So here is a bitly that. Um, so here is a GitHub repo. So I will post it in the chat just in case you're a uh, you missed the last talks. Um, so in the GitHub repo, I type it in the chat. So in GitHub repo, so I'm actually listing a couple of uh, uh, all the materials, all the links in the collab. So for example, like we introduced about the job lab and there is a simple job lab demo that uh, I want to show you. Um, so you can simply click those badge and they will but but with the session for the uh for the Google Colab. And you can simply connect that and to running that. So I want to save time and then I will not running the demo. At the same time, I would say that Google Colab uh need a lot of like tweaks for it for after some time. So it's um I don't have time. Uh, frankly speaking, I don't have time to update uh, in a timely manner for to make everything running on the previous on, on all those demos uh, listed here. And also, whenever we're talking about high performance machine learning, so it's the capability for the collab is limited. So, for example, like in the under the Google collab, I can only use two threads, two hyper threads. And in my session, and also that kind of thing that make uh, us possible impossible to show the complete demo. Um, but uh, I believe that uh, there is uh, some code. If you see some code, I want just to give you some general idea on what it looks like. And uh, as I said in my first talk, the code is just uh, not to, not for going through uh, line by line during my talk. It's better for you to check uh, the part that interests you most and then running it under your own environment. Especially, uh, you can simply just running on the Hopin2. If you need any support, let me know running on Hopin2. And then I believe that might be a better way to learn something on the subject. And uh, so there's a uh, this this demo showing the scikit-learn to uh, using some joblet. And you can see that it's a, a, in a session, in the collab session, we can only running with the two threads. So, uh, and then there's a, I list some common usage so that I copied it directly from the uh, documentation for the joblet. So you can see that it's, a, if there's a, they provided with some delayed operations so that it makes our lazy evaluation, caching and lazy evaluation possible for, for us. And also there's a, I copied it, there's some examples from some uh, tutorials in the plural site. So I think this is the, this is the one that is showing the basic idea on how to use uh, Joblib in pipeline and uh, in the example, she used uh, for to try to search, make a grid search on hyperparameters for some simple uh, models. That's a pretty, um, a pretty simple and uh, pretty straightforward. I would highly recommend it that if you're working on those and you can check, you know, because we talk about uh, the secular using secular are actually no. Uh, no other things. So it's just the typical scikit-learn uh, template to call the model fit and that kind of thing. But whenever you say, for example, like we define the estimators, we running the fit on the estimators, and then we can running the multi-cores and just uh, uh, to define it with the uh, end jobs to take advantage of that. And then that meaning like we use the two thread instead of one thread. So, and you can see that we actually save the time. And uh, 
So those are actually the droplet internally uh, implemented in the scikit-learn. And then the last section uh, in this demo is to using Dask for the droplet in scikit-learn. It actually, you have to install some additional packages um, uh, to using the Dask. And also you may restart the runtime for the collab session. And uh, then you can create the local cluster. So unfortunately, uh, so I mean, uh, and Google Colab, you don't have that much like a multi-threading resources, but it's a uh, it can be done. I mean, this is only for illustration purpose. So you can see that we can with simply we can uh, with the job dot parallel backend with the desk, and when whenever we define the search for the uh, for the model and for all those uh, all those normal scikit-learn code. And then we actually do this in a parallel way. So those are the the thing that I want to show that uh, there's the job lib integration between the job lib and the scikit-learn are actually not that bad. So, um, so you can see that it's a parallel and then using the of the 30 minutes to finish all those searching for the randomized uh, agreed search. So those are the demos for the job lab. And uh, we just to jump back to our slides. So we move to another topic that for the high performance machine learning using the accelerators. So uh, I think there's a, there's a, we already mentioned that uh, in the multiple times that in scikit-learn alone are actually don't have no support to any accelerators so far. So, uh, so they, they don't have, you cannot running the scikit-learn directly on the GPU, not to say the TPU or the other like a uh, AI chips. No, there is no way to running the scikit-learn directly on that. And uh, instead of doing that, so we have a couple of options. So to, to running the scikit-learn-ish stuff or tasks on the GPU or TPU or, or those accelerators. So one obvious option would be the rapid. So there are some library from NVIDIA that they, I think uh, uh, NVIDIA becomes really hot uh, nowadays. And they obviously, they have their uh, persistent ambition to, to take the dominant role continuously in the AI and the data science domain. So, and the one thing that they actually put cons a, cons a constant effort is to develop uh, rapid libraries. So those rapid libraries are, will provide with the same APIs as the scikit-learn. So internally, they don't use scikit-learn. So they, they are ambitious, meaning like they rewrite the whole kernels and the whole um, estimator something by their CUDA, by their uh, using in order to use the GPU. So those are, you can thinking about that is uh, because we already have a, uh, humongous like a uh, sci-fi ecosystems. So there will meaning the huge amount of work. So I believe that with their with their company becomes a uh, uh, strong and uh, and uh, monster like. So I think they I believe that they will actually re-implement re-implement it all by themselves. And I want to say that they provided with a fully compatibility to the other like SciPy or Scikit-Learn, um, those stuff. I mean, the Python uh, ecosystem, uh, the other Python like libraries. 
And uh, there is a diagram that I copied from their, their NVIDIA website. So you can find there is a one-to-one uh, -one correspondence between the normal Python libraries versus the NVIDIA-based libraries. For example, like they will have, a, you can find that they can have a NumPy correspond to the CuPy and uh, for the NumPy arrays, I mean the CUDA supported, CUDA supported, enabled for the array type of operations. And then for the data frame, so usually people actually using more and more, uh, if we want to use on the GPUs, then all the Panda can be replaced by the cool uh, DF data frame. And for the scikit-learn, that our main topic today is CUDA machine learning, CUML. And of course, for the other libraries, let's say I'm giving an example that uh, let's say the network X, they also have their corresponding like a replacement. They call it like the cool graph. I want to say that if you look at the, those uh, uh, diagram, there's no coupi because coupi are not from NVIDIA, I believe, so historically. So, and uh, but uh, people usually just uh, using everything in started with the CU for, but coupi is are actually in a enabled CUDA version of NumPy. So those functionality are pretty good. So I have some, I used to work on some example code and using CuPy are actually taking big advantage of the GPU computation power. And I easily got the three orders of magnitude performance boost. So I just uh, honorably mentioned the CuPy under those uh, rapid software libraries from NVIDIA, but it's a CuPy is actually not original, not from NVIDIA. Um, so um, I want to say before I mentioned about the the, uh, the limitness of the uh, rapid. So I want to point out that nowadays in the uh, cutting edge researches, um, so usually people not using the rapids alone. They you you they you usually works uh, use the rapids together with the other libraries say for example like uh, in we they can combine with uh, dusk backend and the uh, blazing sql and then or they can running on some spark uh like a spark clusters on that so those are more effective so if you're going to the nvidia website you will see that there is a couple of um, many many links to show the examples that rapids works with those like uh, big data domain players on that um i would say that i'm in, i was impressed a lot by some previous research i think 2 years ago that uh, in the oak ridge national lab they collaborated with scripts, uh, scripts research to analyze the 1.3 billion docking results. So they use Dusk plus Rapids plus uh, Blazing SQL. So they can build those billions of docking results in seconds. So when we when they running those combinations of uh, 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 allies of all those big uh, uh, big data libraries on some supercomputer for there because they're coming from Oak Ridge. So they running on the summit and then they're pretty impressive. So to get those kind of achievements. I want to mention that in uh, for us. So there's a couple of problems of the rapids. Everything looks pretty uh, perfect candidate to boost the performance for our machine learning task. But there is a uh, I want to point out some uh, some uh, uh, we have to keep in mind a little bit on using the the rapids. The one is installation and configuration of uh, rapids are a little bit complicated, and uh, it's I actually for myself I always have some headaches to install install and uh, configure those rapids on different systems. 
So it's very specific to the hardware. And also the bad thing for that is there's no pip install, at least as far as I know. So you have to install Rapids through Conda. So sometimes Conda just running, there are some problems on the on the Conda. So I, and also they, um, although they have their amb ambition to doing with the large uh, data. So there's a, as far as I know, so they are still limited by the available memory on the GPU card. So most of the traditional machine learning problem need to load the data with the limits to use for the real uh, big data problem. So, uh, so uh, and also one more thing is for the really big data problems. So, so far, I don't see any updates for the Rapids library to use more than one GPU. So basically that means like we cannot take advantage of multiple GPU yet. So that's also we should keep in mind. And of course, not to say that, as I mentioned, so to rewrite all the uh, APIs, all the models uh, by themselves, and to replace the SciPy ecosystem, it's gonna take a long period of time to re-implement everything with CUDA. So that's uh, the that's sometimes uh, uh, we need to keep in our mind if we really uh, thinking about using the Rapid in our work. And uh, another options obviously coming from some competitor, uh, uh, some NVIDIA competitor. One thing is, one is from Intel. So the Intel, they have their own accelerator uh, compiled for the machine learning task. They call it like scikit-learn Intel EX, mean, meaning Intel EX, meaning Intel, expen um, uh, Intel extension for scikit-learn. So, it's a provided with a higher level API to their own, uh, they call it like a DAL, meaning the data analytic library developed by their uh, Intel One API. So they, looks like they can have a best performance running on the Intel based uh, architecture, including with the Intel CPU, uh, X, 80, uh, X6, X6, X6A4 and or Intel-based GPU. So they use a lot about uh, using the uh, vector instructions and also they did a lot of uh, specific memory optimizations for their architecture, for their threading and for their optimizations. Um, I actually copied a couple of uh, uh, charts that uh, they running for the for some training task and for some inference or prediction task to you can see that there's a, a y axis are the the speed up say so say the 100 speed up two orders of magnitude the three orders of magnitude and the one orders of magnitude most most the models that they compiled by them are actually achieving a very a uh, very good performance boost. To using that, it's a pretty. I I think that there's a there's a not a, that much. Uh, we need to modify our original sci uh, scikit-learn code. Um, as I said, like uh, in the installations step for the scikit-learn in my previous talk, you you can install that by directly by install those scikit-learn Intel EX. And if you want to do it with the accelerations for your further boost for your code, then you can running, simply running uh, like an optimization patching before you running your code. Let's say you can from a scikit-learn EX import the patch scikit-learn and with the patch scikit-learn. And then you're running patch scikit-learn and then you will actually automatically doing with the optimizations for you. So this is maybe the least amount of uh, code change for that. And 
there is, if you have the GPUs, I mean, this GPU is not NVIDIA GPU. It's only valid for the Intel-based GPU. So, um, and then you may have to uh, specify with some patch and then to, to, to running those uh, configure contacts to, and then to running that and doing the same thing for the patch SK learn, but you may have to install another like runtime libraries to support the Intel GPU on that. So there's a uh, some uh, there's some uh, uh, I copied this graph from one of my talks that I joined I think last year for the Intel last year or a couple of months ago. So they are actually doing with some benchmark to compare with their Intel compiled in extension for the scikit-learn. You can see that there's uh, it, they actually gained a lot of uh, uh, speed up for their um, for for the for for different uh, stages let's say for the model for the model training and then for the prediction stage um as just uh, for the reference i believe that it's a uh, this may it may it may change in the future but uh, it's uh, because i think that uh, there is a there is a lot of uh, us running uh, our desktop or laptop our intel base and then it's a it's better to, if you want to running those scikit-learn under your uh, Intel-based architecture, that would be a pretty good option because there's no need to change the code and you can get the benefit. For the uh, for the Mac machine, so, I, so if you're running with some silicon M1 or M2 uh, based chips, and then you can just, uh, in, and then at the beginning of those Conda, let's say if you work on the Conda environment, so you already in, installed with the Arch, uh, with ARM-based uh, one, and then they will have some, they will automatically support with those uh, Mac-based GPU doing that. I didn't do any benchmark on that. So um, I saw some post that there's there also have some uh, a speed, a speed up on that type. So there's a another option that for using accelerators is uh, the newcomer in the playground. They call it the JAX. So the JAX is a uh, well. We can think about a, a replacement for the NumPy. So basically, the what oh, the reason main reason why the scikit-learn cannot running on the accelerator is that they build on top of NumPy, but NumPy can do not have the direct support on running on the accelerator. And uh, JAX is a library that actually uh, an equivalent NumPy library. So it get compiled for the high performance numerical uh, computing. It it uh, so it's uh, when compiled, it will be able to, uh, let's say we can think about the deck is uh, Python's NumPy with automatic differentiation and optimize running uh, all types of, uh, including CPU, GPU, and the TPUs. So um, XLA are, uh, they call it, is sort of a something, I think, uh, I forgot the full name, but it's sort of like a domain-specific compiler for linear algebra. Oh, it's an accelerated linear algebra. So it's a, originally it's it's a, provide some acceleration for the TensorFlow models, and uh, now it seems like people using more and more a standalone kernel for other purposes. I know that there's a lot of, uh, they got uh, uh, more and more usage among the scientific communities. So because they are more flexible and they, I listed a couple of features for the JAX, for example, like they can provide with automatic differentiation inherited from those XLA technology. So they will forward, provide forward and the reverse mode of uh, 
automatic differentiation of arbitrary numerical functions. And they can also provide with the vectorization for the CMD programming uh, through the automatic vectorization. Oh, sorry. And also they can, they actually have uh, take advantage of the JIT compilation. So, um, so those are just uh, the JAX. I think uh, the community of the JAX will be thriving soon and it's very promising. Unfortunately, for the working with the JAX and Scikit-learn are still in an early, very early stage. So I actually keeping my finger crossed to see whether there will be a further development or provided with some higher level of wrappers for the data scientists like myself to use directly use the JAX and uh, with under those uh, secular contests. So that would be very interesting. So there's an, another, um, I listed another demos for accelerator demo. And uh, if you click the second badge for the collab demo, so in this, in this, I'm showing there's a uh, I'm showing how to use some code, how to use the rapids, and uh, how to use the scikit learn to running some simple problems, let's say random forest classifiers, um, copying uh, most of the code from different uh, uh, places, including like NVIDIA website and the Intel uh, website for that. And uh, uh, in the collab, we you have to use the GPUs here. And uh, as I said, the installation of the Rapids would be a very uh, big headache on that. Um, I ran this code, I checked those code the last year, but I haven't doing any updates for this year. Probably they may, you may get some stuck under the collab session, but um, I will uh, update that whenever I got time after the class. But uh, my point here is I want to show you, there's a, just give you some, uh, some impression on how it looks like in the rapid, uh, rapid AI on sort of thing. So you can see that we just uh, import uh, CUDA data frames, and then we call with the uh, with the uh, different models uh, estimators uh, developed by those uh, CUDA uh, machine learning. That's a uh, whenever whenever we see this, we will consider this one as the CUDA version of scikit-learn. So CUDA random forest classifiers. And then we define a couple of, uh, we prepare for our modeling work and we we doing with the, some uh, data preparation. And then for the GPU, we doing basically the same thing to CUDA data frame to from pandas because we got our data in the panda and then we need to convert this into uh, the CUDA based uh, data frame. And then in the scikit-learn model, so we are doing the same thing. We import with the panda based and the running the normal standard scikit-learn model. And then we can run it with the CUDA, a scikit-learn uh, CUDA version of the scikit-learn. And then we're doing basically API with the same thing. So, and also uh, the code also showing that how to pickle, how to save and then dump or rest restore the, the model that we already trained. So here, and I'm doing some time, uh, record the time. And then the last part is uh, for the scikit-learn Intel extension model. So you can see that we only calling this of course, we already installed everything under uh, in the in the very beginning. But then after installation, 
we only need to call this uh, from scikit-learn ex import a patch scikit-learn so call the patch scikit-learn and then there will be everything calling with the with the same say for example for from scikit-learn example import uh, random forest classifiers those are just the standard scikit-learn so we only running with the patch on the top of those uh, standard scikit-learn call and then we can running our model and to fit and to make pre predict and then to check the accuracy of that. And those are patching for the uh, optimization patching for the GPU are not available for the Google like Colab. They didn't provide it with the Intel type of uh, processor graphic card on that. So, um, but uh, it's enough for us to make a comparison on that. So I collected with us with the, some results. So previously uh, we're running on that. So you can see that uh, there is a, for the data loading. So those green line are the standard, like a no speed up. Those are just the standard uh, scikit learn. You can see that for, for data loading. So, um, so, CUDA because we need to move the data from the CPU to GPU from the uh so that's why it's a it takes even longer time compared with the standard scikit-learn but then it actually performs better for the training let's say doing the CUDA ML and then either doing the Intel EX so but you can see that interestingly, whenever we're doing the predictions, they actually performs uh, worse compared with the standard scikit-learn. And also, but then when we are checking with the ROC like scores, those are actually get a, a, a better score on that. So, um, so those are just the speed up times, uh, not better score, but they actually take a much a uh, shorter time to get the score on that. So I'm just saying like, uh, this is uh, just as a reference and to see how it looks. And then there will be, um, there will be an interesting topic that uh, uh, what the future would look like to taking advantage of the accelerators using for our general machine learning tasks on uh, yeah, so this is a, a, I need to jump back to my slides. So this would be our third, we finished our third topic. And our last topic is we, what if we, our problem is a high or large data set. So processing large data sets are Are, I have some special considerations for all for our for the sci data scientists like us. So and uh, the large data sets meaning like it's a most scikit learn estimators only work for the in memory arrays. So I want to mention that in this slides we. We're talking about uh, if the data is available upfront. So you have your data available. Maybe uh, we we can say that all the data are there, but it's too big. So there's no no problems for the upfront for uh, there's, there's there's no point for 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 the a partial like a streaming yet, and in that case. Is still a big challenge because the most scikit-learn estimators only work for the in-memory arrays. And then uh, we have to admit that the scikit-learn have a very limited capability to dealing with this case. So it can be done maybe in the NumPy, so use the memory uh, and map that to map your memory to the disk. So that's actually is not well developed. And I don't think this is, would be the way. So that means we probably need different data frames 
other than Panda, other than NumPy. And also we need to implement different algorithms. So this is the, this is the situation that we have to face. And uh, there's a two in that case. So I'm, uh, in my experience, so there may be there may be others, but uh, from my experience, there are two available options that we can consider. One is from Dusk, that Dusk is the whole package or suite for machine learning. So they provide with the different, uh, different uh, like uh, the data types. Let's say the data array, uh, a Dusk array, Dusk data frame task uh, like data bags all that kind of thing so i believe that i uh i think i mentioned a little bit in my last quarter's talk about high performance python so but using the task for machine learning meaning you have to use their own data frames and also using their own like algorithms because task machine learning that all all of the algorithms are actually uh, implemented well on larger than memory data sets. So, uh, so they will be a very good candidates for dealing with uh, uh, large data sets in this case. And also another option would be to using uh, VAEX uh, lab, uh, labs, VAEX lab air, Basically, the writes part of the VAEX are the simply wrappers to the scikit-learn. And uh, of course, they may, but some are actually, they re-implemented by themselves. And uh, so far, as far as I know, they they have their package, we call it VAEX.MachineLearningML. It does not yet implement for predictive models. They only provide wrappers for power for, uh, for, for some other estimators. And, uh, uh, but they have, the, but they actually implement some standard data transform, transformers. And uh, like, uh, I mean, the data transformers meaning specifically meaning something like a PCA, numerical scalars, uh, categorical encoders, that kind of thing, and a very efficient k-means algorithms that taking full advantage of VAEX data frames. So uh, you have to use, if you want to use the VAEX machine learning package, you have to use VAEX data frames. So those are some like points that I want to uh, say, and uh, there is a, also, there are some uh, uh, demos, code demos that uh, we can check. And uh, in this collab demo, we, uh, I'm just, uh, I think I'm copied somewhere Code the snippets from the page, the link page from the task uh, documentations. You can see that we have to install within the collab session that for the task distributed, a uh, task ML, and uh, and we have to import those uh, task ML datasets, task ML uh, cluster. And then you can see that we can, uh, so using the task, then we can, we have to do it with something like a persist that uh, delay all the kind of uh, tricks that have to be applied for those task ML. But my point is using those task ML have, can have a very, uh, can very uh, quick start for us if we want to test our like a, a parallel mode or to read with some uh, uh, exceed our memory, like uh, dealing with the ex extremely big data sets on that kind of a type of problem. So those are, are pretty handy and those are pretty quick to, to be 
uh, adopted in our approach. But I would say that there are some, uh, um, usually you're running some sim uh, samples or demos are pretty fast and quick and straightforward. But I would say that I have to admit that my learning curve about desk are pretty steep. So those, uh, I feel like the desk are a complete, very complicated topic. So I would, I would just suggest that you may, uh, if you really want to scale up your approach, then you can spend your time and energy to learn the task and then to learn the task ML to follow their updates. I believe that they're being, they may have a huge, big upgrades or updates so that uh, for us to, to be adopted, for, for our approach to be adopted. And the VAEX, also the same thing. So I have a very good experience running the VAEX for some problems, but also have very uh, some headache and uh, compatibility issues using the VAEX. So, and you can see that it's uh, sort of the same thing. They calling with the VAEX.ml and every function of APIs are pretty similar uh, as the standard scikit-learn. So all those are pretty much uh, looks the same, but but it's only for for those demos. So sometimes you may find that there's a, some functions are not provided and some compatible so you cannot running on some data formats or such and such. So I would say I don't want to just make some advertisement for using any of those, but I'm just want to telling you that the situation that I, I used to met and uh, keep that in mind. But this those. VAEX and Dusk are still the options if you want to work with the super big data sets on that. So um, the last topic within the processing the big data is out of core learning. So out of core learning uh, sort of, a, mm, it's still the big data how to process a very large data set. But the, the, the difference is that sometimes we got the data, but it's uh, it's not available. And, it's, and the whole data set is not available when we need to do some processing work. And if in the case of the previous slides, we're talking about the large data sets and we have all the data up front, for processing, and sometimes we call it as some like a, a batch batch data available. So, so that's uh, stored on the disk or database. And uh, but sometimes in the big data area, big data regime, so we have to deal with some data streams. So at the, I mean, the data will come at different time points. It is not all available upfront. And also this might be a more general case because sometimes we cannot, we can think up about the data that too big that we digest may not in one shot, we have to digest the piece by piece. So that's, and so that's would be another like a, a view, uh, view to dealing with the big data problem. And uh, so that would be a more general case for the big data problem. So people always call this as the streaming on the data. Uh, so this would be a very pivotal role in big data processing. I mean, streaming, because there's a uh, the key topic for the big data processing, if you look at the books, they are they will have at least the two chapters to dedicate it for those architectures, like a streaming architectures. Let's say you how can you ingest your data, and uh, you how can you transform and process it before you feed into your machine learning model for prediction. So there are, you can see the jargons about the, the streaming architectures, including with uh, either Lambda or Kappa 
they separate with the streaming process into different layers. For example, in the Lambda, they divide it into three layers, like batch layer, speed layer, serving layer. The Kappa are sort of like a simplified Lambda without the batching layer. All those are jargons are the the major topic of people how to dealing with those uh, 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 processing those big data, uh, streaming big data on that. And uh, also they, based on those uh, different architectures, they have a bunch of technologies to dealing with those streaming the data. I mean, uh, so for example, like you can see like uh, Kafka, Flink, Storm, cloud-based solutions, and all those uh, uh, cloud giant like uh, AWS, GCP, and Azure, all those are spend a huge amount of money to build up all those streaming architectures with uh, various countless technologies on that. Uh, so those are the very big topic. So I want to say that those streaming are just a, a pre-processing for our machine learning. So we will, we don't, it's a, we will not, we will not talk about anything about those streaming uh, in today's talk. So I, this I actually out of our scope for the secular related. Uh, but I want to mention that uh, there's a, Something people always know, everybody know that uh, overfeeding. Overfeeding is a well-studied uh, course of uh, mm, performance difference between the training and the testing. But for under the out-of-core learning, I mean, if the data is a streaming out, so then there is a, another, another issue will come out they sometimes called like a training serving school. So those are the performance difference between our training testing stage and the production stage. So uh, basically that's uh, we can understand this one as a uh, uh, model performs well in back test. So they perform well for the training and for testing, but they will perform poorly in production. So this one are the big, but mm, well, uh, but people actually not to pay much attention for those training and the serving school yet. And uh, there's a possible courses um, for those, uh, why those screw happen. For example, like uh, sourcing the data may from different pipelines for training and the prediction state, I mean, for the production stage. And also they per processed in an ad hoc manner, especially during the prediction stage with many shortcuts and then different shortcuts may uh, result with a different, uh, uh, different consequences on that. So, and also there's some feedback loop between your model and your algorithms. So those are just uh, something that uh, because you're streaming the data and then you may have some like a feedback loop established during those uh, pipeline. And then those, uh, the minor difference or deviate will introduce that kind of screw. So, and uh, so far people talking about the training serving screw solution would be simply to process both training and prediction data as part of the same pipeline. So basically, so we just doing with everything just on the fly, just doing with the same pipeline. So they may solve those screw partially. I mean, this is so far, people need to study those uh, uh, performance difference in details. So I'm just uh, pointing out those because we're in today's talk, we're talking about, I'm talking about performance. So those one are a very important issue that bring us to, to be more attention. So all of core learning using scikit-learn are, um, well, I would say that uh, so far, Maybe I'm lim limited, but uh, um, I'm not in the deep learning uh, that uh, 
expert for dealing with the PyTorch or TensorFlow. But for the secular, I would say that the out of core learning are uh, very well so far, very well supported compared to the other um, uh, machine learning libraries. So, um, but I again, I want to mention that out of core learning, uh, the task that uh, uh, how to say that it's a it's the job that that happened after the streaming the data. So we will assume like in our demo and from this slides, I will assume that we not dealing with the streaming data. So we still find we 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 assume that we already have the way to stream the instances to our machine already. So those are uh, ingestion and processing off stream data are assumed to be done. And then we're talking about after streaming data, the next step would be to extract the features from streamed instances on our machine. And then to transform the data and uh, to make the learning. So that's why we call it the out of core learning. And uh, we facing the prop, the first task we're facing the problem is to extract to be able, we have to find a way to extract the features from um, only a subset of data. That's not completed data sets. And uh, usually if we have everything available, then we extract the feature. And uh, generally speaking, we can say that it's a, we, uh, we build a hash table according to the known available data. So, and then those are the called like a state for feature extractors. So that means it's uh, related with the, uh, with all the data. And then it's related with all the state of the data on that. Uh, it, so that's why it's a must know the complete features set known in advance. And also we have to doing with some in-memory mapping from the uh, string tokens to feature indices. But for a subset of data, so the, those are building a hash table is not available. So we will have to have some, they call it like a stateless feature extractor. So, and uh, in the second learn, they always mention about a, a hashing trick, meaning hashing trick, meaning we need to find, not to build up a hash table, but we need to find some, we use some hash function to mapping between the string tokens to some, uh, to some uh, like uh, values or to some indices. And uh, that, uh, like, we can understand that this way is we can pre-processing vectorizers having no fit because we build up the hash table we need to fit and then, and then we transform mapping and then we're doing the transform. But in the stateless feature extractors, it meaning like we don't have to, we only need to transform, like apply the hash function and we no fit. And then it, it creates a reduced dimensionality hashes of the data. Of course, they may have some clashes. I say the two different data may hash to some of the one value, but it's because the function, the hashing space are so big that it can be uh, ignored. I would say that in our previous exam, uh, demo last week, we used the count vectorizers. So those count vectorizers uh, are I think they they we we read the data in the memory and we know the text vocabulary all up front. But in this case, in the out of core learning, so we need to have a, we need to uh to use the specific like uh, the hash. Uh, I think they 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 have a they call it like a. Uh, feature hasher function inside of the secular. I believe that uh, they use, uh, um, I think they use some uh, uh, some murmur hash three uh, algorithms to build up the, the hash function to some data on that. And uh, whenever we feature, uh, extract the feature from a subset 
of the data, and then we can do with learning algorithms. But learning algorithms also have to be some capability to learning gradually. So that's why they call it like incremental learning algorithms, meaning we have to learn something without seeing all the instance at once. The scikit-learn, the good thing for the scikit-learn that I like the most is they provide some partial fit API. The partial fit API are the group of uh, estimators that can learn gradually, I mean, incrementally. So, and I listed uh, so far in uh, from the scikit-learn that they support the partial fit. Let's say the classifiers, they have naive base, perceptron, SGD, passive aggressive classifiers, Regressors also the same corresponding one. Clustering uh, algorithms, they have many batch, k-means, birch, feature extraction, they have PCA, uh, LDA, and the dictionary learning, such and such. And the pre-processing, they have a, also they have the standard scalar, min-max scalar, that kind of a, a pre-processing modules. Um, one more thing that for the for the uh, for the incremental learning is that we usually uh, we usually have to uh, feed the, the doing the training in many batches. So um, a strategy to implement those out of core skilling is to stream the data to the estimator in let's say the mini batch, uh, and each mini batch is vectorized using hashing vectorizers. But I would say that it's uh, if you check with the different mini batch sizes, they may, sometimes they may influence the result, but sometimes they may not. So that's a very tricky problems for all the out, out of core learning using the scikit-learn. Um, I think I don't have time to go over the details, but uh, there's a, a uh, demo that uh, I love it very much that provided it in scikit-learn and uh, it's dealing with uh, some classification of a document. Um, it uses uh, the database that's a uh, very small database. So it's a collection of documents with news articles. So they have a very small size of uh, documents and then uh, this uh, open source and the demo are actually want to make a binary classification between only one class to another. So those are because those are multi-class uh, data sets. So they only want to just illustrate the out of court techniques. So they we only make the binary classification. So in the scikit-learn, I want to just mention that it's a couple of steps. Is one is we in the demo we doing the streaming, data streaming in a very simplified way. We're not doing with some exotic, that kind of thing, but we just uh, divided the data streaming with the batches and uh, we define with uh, an iterator. It will iterate over the documents of the data sets. And then we, uh, we define a function, they call it the get mini batch so that they can uh, extract the mini batch of examples and return a tuple of x and y. And, also, and then you from the code, you may see that there is some vector riser defined uh, for, there is some, they create a vectorizer using the hashing vectorizer and they define a reasonable maximum of features Two to the times of uh, eighteen, and then would during and and then they in the main training loop they iterate on the many batches of examples. So the the partial fit that is uh, here that I, I'm actually this is not a whole code, but I'm just uh, highlighting the code that uh, I want to mention that it's a uh, it's a uh, by calling the the classification problems of the models for the partial fit, they we um, 
They updated the estimator with examples in the current mini batch for each iteration loop that they will doing with a partial fit and then the streaming the data, processing the more data. And in demo, they I believe they test the four uh, classifiers that support the partial fit, SGD, perception, uh, such and such. So um, we, if you, I, I would suggest that you go to our force, uh, click our force batch, and those are, just uh, the complete uh, Python file I copied from the documentation uh, from the Scikit-Learn uh, website. And you can see that it's a, a pretty neat uh, work. And uh, those are uh, processing the data might looks maybe, uh, maybe confusing, but uh, I believe that uh, the problem itself are well-defined and simple enough to let us to know the key ideas on doing that. Um, so um, I would highly recommend it that if you're interested in the out of core learning. So there are, they compare with a different, uh, uh, like uh, the classification and accuracy as function of the training examples, like uh, different training examples versus accuracy. And remember that we feeding the training uh, gradually. So we are actually started from the small examples to the whole the whole set of that. It's pretty interesting to watch how the performance of uh, of the of the classifiers do. And also they compare with a different running time versus the accuracy, how they how they progress. And also they compare with the training time, running time for a different partial fit like classifiers, those vectorization, I believe they will be the sum of the total value. And uh, those are just uh, checking with the total read and the parse, the feature extraction part and the hashing vectorizer, uh, vectorization, the times running times on that. Those are pretty neat example. So I didn't do much like modification on that. You can go to the original uh, Python file to check and also you can run in our uh, collab to see what, uh, to, to learn something from that. I highly recommend it. Okay, so um, I'm just about to give you a quick uh, takeaways and to wrap up uh, the session that I did for, for the two weeks. So learning scikit-learn means, so we need to understand the machine learning workflow. So we should know something about machine learning and then the scikit-learn will help us to know how to practically code and to running that, establish the models and then to running that. And also learning scikit-learn means that we have to learn its API conventions, dot fit, dot predict, dot transform, fit, transform, such and such. So you have to come back to the documentations because it contains a um, huge amount of uh, like details on that. And uh, you can check with the example code and learning from the example code. That's what I learn um, in most of the times. And uh, you need to consider those extensive libraries like third party or scikit-learn family, scikit uh, such and such, that kind of libraries, though, because scikit-learn meaning only just one tool in your toolbox. And making scikit-learn more productive, or you want to have high performance scikit-learn uh, job done, and you need to make sure everything work fine without performance optimization. This is the first prerequisite. And then you need to carefully profiling the code. And then first, you, you may try is just uh, play around with the job lib uh, to play uh, multiple threads, multiple workers doing that. And then you try with the rapid, uh, scikit-learn or VAEX if needed. Okay, so uh, it's already uh, 12.05, over two hours. And so I'm gonna stop my recording here, but if you have any uh, questions, I will, stay uh, online for, for a while. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions or you want to discuss anything more. Thank you very much.